For people that love science, this is Equinox, where we're striking the balance between the light and the dark. This is episode seven. My name is Joseph Darnell, and I am joined by my good friend, Dr. Robert Carter. Hello, Rob. Hello, Joe, and hello, all our listeners. Thank you so much for tuning in. We have an interesting topic today that's different, getting off of our history of Charles Darwin from the last two episodes. We had a good response from some of our listeners that really enjoyed that subject. But there are no, I know there's another thing that Rob has been doing now for years as a hobby, overlapping with some of his professional work mm-hmm. that I think is going to interest all of you. And I thought we would begin by just talking about what's been going on. So Rob, I, I'm enjoying my fabulous staycation where my family play video games and actually do some gardening outside and take walks in the neighborhood. How about you? What are you doing? Well, I am an antsy sort of person. I don't sit still very well. And so I'm um, kind of chomping at the bit to stay outside and to work and to do other things other than just sitting down on my couch and, you know, staring at a computer screen. Yeah, spring is sprung. And there, there's weeds to pull. There's grass to cut. Uh, there, the bugs are all over the place. I told my son yesterday that, or was it the day before? Anyway, he uh, he wants to do some sort of little business, you know? So both both of my kids have always wanted to like walk dogs in the neighborhood to make some money or cut grass or rake leaves. And I said, well, you know, something I would really like to do would be to keep bees. Oh. My son is 10 years old and he's run away with this idea. So he went on YouTube and he's watched all the videos for beekeepers, hive, you know, honey collectors, and he's fallen in love with the idea. So he's already told me which hive we should buy on Amazon. All right. <laughs> it's well, a I'm going to hive. lend you some of my gear. I have been a beekeeper for years. What? Yes. I'm not currently keeping bees because a couple of moves and, you know, things yeah. haven't worked out uh, as far as beekeeping goes, but I've got some stuff for you. I had no idea. Oh, yeah. I, this Everybody, this is happening live on the podcast. And I've, I've explored a lot of the alternate, you know, organic sort of beekeeping technologies, and they don't really work very well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I'm so new to this. I didn't realize that you could artificially keep bees versus organically keep bees. Oh, oh yes. Yes. Um, In order to keep bees alive, you need to add poison to the hive. <gasps> What? Because of the varroa mites. That sounds like a really bad tribe in the Old Testament. No, there the there varroa are mites. There are several things that will kill off your bee colony. So there oh. there's almost no such thing as organic honey. It almost doesn't ex- exist. Now there are some beekeepers who are going chemical free, good for them. But then again, you can't guarantee that those bees are not flying to a non-organic farm. So there's all these little things in there. Beekeeping is fun and it's, it's amazing oh, and, no. <laughs> and you will get stung. Yes, you will. Really? But not very often. And oh, then you get true. over it and then you get used to it. And then you'll get to the point where you're not even wearing gloves or anything and you're not getting stung. <laughs> Just, I don't know. I think they're like, hey, here's a new guy. Let's sting him. Yeah, but the bees are really cute. And I, I think bees are awesome. I've seen more bees in uh, around my house, my property this spring in the last two weeks then I think I've seen honeybees or any bee of any kind for five years. I don't oh. know how this comes and goes, but I didn't see any honeybees last year at home. So I don't know what's going on. You know, you can find the honeybee hive. How so? Just follow a bee It's home? called making a beeline. That's where the phrase comes from. <laughs> what? You can, you can look at a bee and when he leaves a flower and takes off, he's going straight to his hive. Whoa. And you can go, you know, walk you know, 100 yards that way and wait for another bee. Oh, and you just follow the bees and you can find that hive. It might be a wild hive or it might be someone's backyard hive. Wow. Well, and I'd end up crossing over some, over the river and through the woods and to grandma's house I've yeah, trespassed. Yeah, yeah, you can't really trespass, but still it's cool. <laughs> At least you say, hey, somewhere on the other side of this fence, there's a beehive somewhere and, and sometimes you can find them. We used to live in a house you know, in the woods. We had 500 acres of woods behind me and about 10 or 15 in front of me. And I didn't own all that, but we were in the middle of it. And uh, they were bees. How many hives were you keeping? Uh, The most I ever had was four. Would you call like that beehive hutch thing a single hive? Yeah, I would. But I never had the normal square ones. I started with a top bar hive. And it was really cool because the bees make their own comb. They, they hang, it looks like a, a smile. They, they make their own comb on the bars. 
Um, but harvesting it is difficult because, uh, you know, when you have those, a regular hive, you get that square frame that comes out. You just cut the top off when all the honey pours out. Dude. Cool. Yeah. But it's not that way in a top bar. You have to squish up all the wax and you get a lot of propolis and the, the flavor can be really overpoweringly strong. Really? Yeah. Sharp, and like sharp, sharp cheddar and, cheese, and like not but pleasant. sharp honey. Huh. Yeah, not pleasant. It's like, oh, I don't like this. But we did use it. Hmm. And then I went and I started building some waré hives, which are also top bar hives, but it's a square. It's not like a trough. It's a square box and you stack up on top of each other. And I was making them and selling them, actually. I made a lot of money selling them. And each one of them had a window in it. Hmm. A little piece of wood you could slide and you could look in and see the bees on the inside. Oh, wow. Yeah. Anyway. I had no idea. We, yeah. We're going to have to have a whole episode about bees. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's do that. I'd love that idea. Oh, yeah. because Oh, yeah. The history of it, the, the biology of it. The, uh, where they come from, what's an African bee, what's Africanized. Oh, okay, we're, we're on it. So you also mentioned to me that you had a very popular new video on YouTube for the coronavirus. Yes, my first video to crack 1,000 views. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm very, very happy. I know it's not a million views, but I'm not expecting ever to be one of those super popular uh, you know, YouTube stars because they. I'm targeting a niche audience. Sure. And you also hit a variety of different science subjects and you're still feeling out how you want to deliver your shows. Oh, yes. very. And I'm changing the way I present on camera. I'm learning really quickly to, you know, not turn in a circle, not top up and just stand still, Carter. <laughs> That's really hard, but I'll force but see, myself to stand I, still. I don't know if I agree. Like, I, I mean, I respect your opinion, but I don't agree. I, I like the lively scientist or the lively YouTuber, because you don't look like an idiot. A lot of the guys get on there and they're like, they're just overkill silly. Yeah, I don't like that. You're physically animated, but everything you say is intelligent. So it it's a balance. And I don't know. All I've right. kind of well, liked I'm, it I'm still strike seeking that balance that I'm happy with. Yeah. So my video, Corona Spiracy, is my first YouTube video that has cracked 1,000 views. I'm really happy about that. I also... After a week, uploaded it natively on Facebook because Facebook doesn't like sharing YouTube videos because they're different platforms. I was wondering about that just recently concerning some of the social media for CMI. Yeah, but by loading it natively, I got another 700 views on Facebook. Excellent. Without Excellent. advertising. Hmm. So I'm, I'm very happy about this. Um, and I'm kind of hoping some of my other ones, because I don't think the Coronavirus is really important as far as society is concerned at the moment, but it's not a long-term thing that I'm going to be talking about. Yeah, once yeah, it has come and gone, it's just going to be another virus for the history books. Yeah, but we're still going to be needing answers about Adam and Eve and speciation and evolution and mutation and natural selection. Mm -hmm. I mean, Christians want answers to those questions, and that's what I'm going to be trying to provide. Okay. So what did you dive into with a title like Corona Spiracy? I, I just wanted to understand... What are you what are you playing at, Rob? I addressed multiple memes that are floating around that are false. Oh, okay. Like um the the one that said, Oh, if you gargle salt water, mm. or the one that said, if you take a hair dryer and blow the hot air up your nose. <laughs> these these are totally false. <laughs> these fact, trolls. They well, will they, nothing will stop them. But the hair dryer one could actually be dangerous because if you're drying out your mucous membranes. You're yes. making yourself susceptible to all sorts of other viral and bacterial infections. Oh. Duh. You don't oh. want dry mucous membranes. That's the point of them being wet. And I addressed, has it been around since before January? A lot of people, oh yeah, we we're all sick in November. A whole church went down in, in December and it wasn't the flu. And and so therefore, their next claim is, oh, therefore it was coronavirus. No, it's not. None of the genetic data backs up the, the idea that this is around Anywhere in the world before November. And but people, a lot of bugs go around. People yeah, get every sick winter. for a variety of different things. Exactly. Lots and lots of things. Every fall, we get hit by the ragweed. Every summer, we get hit by the pollen. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking earlier that how our driveways and cars are yellow because we're in the great pollination of mm -hmm. Georgia. I had a, a back maybe five years ago, my doctor uh, visit, and I thought I had one thing. My th wife thought I had another. And then the doctor said, actually, you have three things. You've got a virus, a bacteria, and allergies all happening at once. And that's why you are wow. wiped out. So you had a virus and you had allergies and the combined symptoms allowed a bacteria to grow mm -hmm. and all the mucus production and gunk. The bacteria is like, oh, I found a home. It was terrible. 
Yeah. But this stuff happens, you know, and it's not just because of the, and you know, COVID-19 is what, can you, can you real quick explain to me, because I've got so many stories I've heard on the internet from so many various trolls and media outlets. I understand there is a virus. It is one type of coronavirus, but then there's this COVID-19 plus I've heard that there's actually another disease or something that, that we're actually getting. How does this all interplay? Using evolutionary terminology, people have very much muddied the waters. Just this time around for this virus? For this particular, yeah, there's two strains. It's mutating. Well, it's not an X-Men mutating. It's just randomly mutating. But because Darwinists look at mutation as a driver of all innovation, it's mutating. What does that mean? So they're actually using it very ambiguously. But yeah, there's one or two mutations that separate these two supposed strains. And they're genetically distinct. We can tell which one you have, but that's no different than the annual flu season where every person's essentially getting their own virus hmm. and is mutating within them and they pass it on. And I mean, there's like 20 mutations per year hmm. in the flu virus on average. Hmm. And so this thing is mutating, but so what? Okay, so it's not as clear as I was thinking. Like there was the coronavirus, and this is one of many, but then this is the one they call COVID 19. But you're saying there's actually two strains, not just COVID 19? Well, there's as many strains as you want. I mean, there's eight major branches in the, in the phylogenetic tree of this brand new virus. Okay. But each branch is one or two mutations separate. Hmm. So maybe, you know, let's say you get it, God forbid. Let's say you get it and you're really sick and you pass it to your wife, hopefully not. And she gets really sick and she passes it to your kid. Well, at any step step in that process, it can mutate. There could be a genetic mutation, a genetic change. Hmm. And each one of you then would have a different strain. Yeah. Because it's we can identify it as genetically different. Now, no Makes one would sense. ever call it a genetic strain from the doctor's point of view. It's the same exact thing. It just has some genetic differences because RNA is a really lousy way to store genetic information. And RNA viruses mutate very quickly. Hmm. Interesting. Does this explain why it's a little bit uh, lengthy in the process of getting a vaccine? Uh, one of the problems with uh, mutating viruses is that if the thing that our immune system sees changes, you need a totally different vaccine. Oh, but okay. this is not hmm. the flu. See, every year the flu recombines with other flus. And so it's H3N2, H1N1, H2N5. Well, each one of those H's and N's is something totally different. And so because there's so many different combinations, you keep on catching the flu every year because now it's, it's a totally different thing. Your immune system doesn't recognize it from the year before. <sighs> but this is not recombining the coronavirus. Mm. It's just mutating. So it looks like the mutation rate is slow enough. We will be able to develop a vaccine. Mm. That's good news. Yeah. But it'll be two years before a vaccine is ready. Uh, see? Okay. Because of, it's an industrial process. And there's all these government yeah. hoops you got to drive through. I think that there's still a lot of people that have hopes that a vaccine is just around the corner. Well, there's probably 11 different countries that are, are companies, I should say, that are working on a vaccine for this. But after they prototype the vaccine, they still have to do animal trials. I heard one group saying they wanted to go j straight to straight the, to people. Yeah. yeah, but that supersedes all of the protocols we do in medicine. You don't yeah. want to do that. No, oh. and it, you know, Great so it takes a problems. long time. And even after even after you show, look, it's safe for people. You still have to process it industrially mm. and make an assembly line. You can't just walk into a factory and say, "Okay, we're going to start making coronavirus vaccine today." <laughs> It's not the way it works. So it, even if you didn't have to do all the government regulations, it would be at least six months after you get one that works. Mm. So our best bet is to keep quarantine. That's the best bet is to keep quarantine. <sighs> okay. Yep. All right. Well, Rob, let's move on to the thing that is a little bit more interesting and pleasant to discuss. I think that everyone is interested in their family history to some extent, where whether it's their extreme past, present, or future. I mean, we are 20 minutes in, and we haven't even told people what the topic of today is. Yeah. Okay. But it is time. Okay. So we are going to talk about family DNA history, uh, the family tree, and the human genome, and getting your genome, what do you call it, uh, written? Sequenced. Uh, coded? Sequenced? Analyzed? Yeah. Depends. Rob, what is this and why do people do it nowadays? 
Wow, that's an open-ended question. So I can talk for about three days on that one question right there. See, you're seeing as how you've studied it for how many years? Oh my. I've been studying my own genealogy since 1988. And this is where a lot of your career and knowledge base, your expertise overlaps with your hobby. Yeah, it was. I took a genetics course at Georgia Tech my sophomore year in the fall. And I was so excited about genetics. And I went home and said, hey, mom, I want to learn where the red hair in the family comes from. Huh. And, you know, I, I mentioned several other things in the family that pop up here and there. And I said, do we have any like, you know, documents or anything? And she goes, oh, do we? And she brought out a box. Awesome. And that was the beginning. And this, but this is before the internet. And it wasn't this so much about computers. the scientific research of the Carter family history. It was actually the history lineages books and papers and yeah. things. Yeah, and old and pictures journals and, and things like that. And so nice. I learned all sorts of amazing things about my family, all the different countries we came from in Europe. Hmm. Um, and then later on, I, I spent, man, I went to the National Archives in Atlanta many times. I went to state archives. I went to Mormon reading rooms in Manhattan. Whoa. I was, I was really into it because, you know, they had computers. <laughs> or microfilm. I have yes. spent days looking through microfilm at census records. Neat. Yeah, now it's all easy. You go on ancestry.com, yeah. you type in a name, and boom, you're all finished. Oh, wow. man, that would have taken me years what I can do in a day now. I remember when I originally checked out, what was it, 23andMe and Ancestry.com maybe seven or eight years ago, that it was already pretty good. But I also felt like I just wasn't ready to take the plunge yet because I noticed that there were a lot of gaps. It looked like it needed more members. It needed more DNA histories. What do you think? It, has it kind of come into its own now? Uh, each of those companies has millions of customers. Now, 70% of the customers are of European ancestry. Interesting. So if you're a Pacific Islander or Australian Aboriginal or African American or Native American, you might be out of luck. But they should get on it. They should get on it. Uh, except um, most of the tribal councils in North America have asked their members to not participate in any genetic study. This overlaps with what we were talking about with ancient DNA. Yeah, exactly. And so Native American ancestry is not easy to figure out. The whole, you know, the whole um, hmm. you know, folks a hauntus thing from six months ago with Elizabeth Warren, when her ancestry came back and she had, yeah, she had some Native American ancestry, but it wasn't any more than millions of other Americans have. Ah. And it was a big debacle. And yeah, and well, she's not mm -hmm. running for president anymore. But anyway. Right. So then I didn't mean to derail you. You no, were talking okay. about your family and all the exploration you took over the years, studying, pouring over the microfiche. Yes. And then DNA comes on the scene. When did that begin? Well, the human genome was, I think the draft was 2001, and then it was finalized in 2003. And then the HapMap project kicked in where they looked at uh, not quite a million letters and a few thousand people from around the world. For per perspective, the 2003 was the year that the iPod, the original iPod was released. Oh, man. <laughs> 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 now I have the Thousand Genomes Project on a spare drive at home. Because don't you want a thousand genomes on a spare drive? Hmm. Doesn't everybody? <laughs> and I have hundreds of Y chromosomes from the Simons Genome Diversity Project, the Human Genome Diversity Project. What are you doing with them? What I'm, do you do with them? Well, I write computer programs. I analyze data. I look for trends. I look for th the low-hanging fruit that maybe an evolutionist might not look for. Hmm. Because there's questions I'm asking that they're not thinking to ask. So I say, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to ask that question. And it's been a very frustrating experience because the data is not good enough. Huh. Like when they did the Thousand Genomes Project, I mean, the U.S. government spent a lot of money sequencing 1,000 human genomes. In 2003? No, this, this is 10 years later. Okay. But they did it to a very low quality. Of course they did. But why? What, what was the end result? Why, why? Because they're asking different questions. What they were looking for was big differences amongst people. Are the people who are missing genes or people who have a a duplicated piece of a chromosome or an inversion or something like that. And they did find some of the, the big gross differences from one person to another. Not many, but they did find some. But because it's low quality data, you cannot use the data to figure something out like uh, the mutation rate, which for me, that yeah, is, it was just that's a snapshot. the question. It wasn't following a history of those genomes. Yeah, but you can use that for a lot of historical analysis because they did people from all around the world. Okay. And you can look at how different they are. You just, when you look at like, you know, this person has 
50 mutations different from that person, you can't trust that number. It could be 30, it could be 100. Mm. And so we can't know the mutation rate. Therefore, the whole question of how long does it take to accumulate all the mutations we see in people, we can't answer the question yet. And it's really, really frustrating. I wish they had done 100 high quality genomes rather than 1,000 low quality genomes. But that was a decision. Mm. And, but see, now we have other things coming online. The Simons Genome Diversity Project, they did high quality DNA for thousands of people. And I've been cranking through that. And when you get to the Y chromosome, which is what I've been doing a lot of studying on, it's a little frustrating there too, because the Y chromosome is 60 million letters long, but only about 10 million of that can we actually sequence accurately. Whoa. The rest of it is so repetitive and there's... It, it changes so much that you can't, even if you sequence the whole thing for one person, yeah. you can't line it up against another person. Oh, wow. Because there's a deletion, there's a duplication, there's an inversion, there's all this repetitive DNA that, that changes copy number every generation. And it's so frustrating. But there's about 10 and a half million letters that we trust that don't move around too much. And we can look at it from one person to another. Just 10 and a half million letters, y'all. <laughs> That's not much. If you consider that maybe one out of a thousand letters is different, hmm. I mean, most of our genome is 100% identical between every person on earth. So if you're only looking to places that differ 10 million, you might be lucky to get 100,000. In fact, no, the number is about 30,000. Hmm. It's about 30,000 to 60,000 variants we find amongst people, men specifically around the world on the hmm. Y chromosome. And we don't know how long it takes to accumulate that number of mutations. Huh. So what did you discover about yourself and well, your family history? Well, um, I found out that my mother's 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 mother, Rinske Everts van der Vliet, <clears throat> R-I-N-S-K-J-E, that's her first name. I can't pronounce it. I was going to say, bless you. Yes. Uh, she was Frisian. I knew that from the family history. And 23me.com pegged it. They said, this is, you know, I am not just from Holland. I'm from Northern Netherlands on the coast up in Frisia. And her mitochondria, which is my mitochondria, because I got it, that was my mother's line there, um, is H16, which is very rare in Europe. And it's, H is very common. Like 80% of Europeans have an H, but I don't know anything about this group because it's very rare. My dad, though, his, his my grandmother is 100% German. And so going back in time, it's nothing but German people. He has a non-H mitochondria. Now, I didn't get that because you don't get mitochondria from your, your father, only from your mother. But he had a U. Whoa, that's like hunter-gatherer Europe. That's like pre-modern European Europe. It's like, where on earth did that come from, Dad? Yeah. You're a caveman. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. All you use out there. Just kidding. <laughs> it gets better than that, though. Yeah. Because last Thanksgiving, there was a Black Friday special. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Dante Labs said, we will sequence your whole genome. Oh, okay. All three billion letters. Is this another organization connected to 23 and Me? Oh, no, no, no. It's, just, it's just a sequencing lab. Okay. And they're trying to do whole genome sequencing of their customers. Now, the first human genome cost $3 billion. Who was that very special individual to well, get Well, it genome? was actually a mix of people because they didn't want to have anything personally identifiable. Uh, okay. But one of the people turns out to have more sequence covers than all the other people, but okay, whatever. Um, but then um, uh, Craig Venter, at the same time, his company was sequencing the human genome privately and they sequenced Craig Venter's genome. Of course they did. <laughs> I assumed that they would have. <laughs> so, I, but I've had mine done too. Guess how much it cost me? It wasn't $3 billion. Black Friday special last November. Oh. If you got a 99% discount, <laughs> what would that more than be? that, <laughs> take a guess, take a guess. I'm a cheapskate. Okay. I, I would have said, if I didn't know that you were a cheapskate, I would have said $300, but I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with a hundred. Dude, it was $189. My third guess was going to be $190. <laughs> <laughs> 199 maybe. I had, I did not expect you to get that close, man. I thought you could say ten thousand dollars <laughs> or maybe a thousand, maybe. Well, the only thing that kind of informed my guess was that I know that a lot of consumers, everyday people, are getting these sequences done. They're getting the DNA testing done. Yeah, but and this is more. Than how just... can you have millions of members on 23andMe for something that is priced amount? 
But Ancestry, 23andMe.com, Family Tree DNA, they're only looking at about maybe 900,000 individual letters. Only about. Only about. I did my, I had my entire genome sequenced. The whole thing. To high, now, why would that I do that? Deal. It's because. Well, why would they make that discounted offer? That sounds yeah, like a they're lot losing money. of work. They're losing money. There's no way they're making money. But as soon as it was done, hey, buy this special report for another $200 and you'll learn about your uh, metabolism and oh, okay. your sports physiology and, you know, your allergies. <laughs> so they're trying to make wondering if you money get by to that upselling. Kind of, uh-huh. Yeah, which is fine. And I didn't take any of their bite. But, but you, and, and I knew it was coming. Uh, oh, yeah. Except I can do most of the analyses myself anyway, so I don't need them. Oh, I see. Well, it helps to be a scientist. It does. It does. Now, but why would someone want to do this? And the answer is because of medicine. In the future, most of us will have our genomes on file with our doctor's office. And you go to the doctor, he's like, oh, you've got this? Well, I'm going to give you this. Oh, no, I'm not going to give you that. I'm going to give you this other drug because this first one, that, that doesn't match your genes, but this one does. This has been a long promise and it's been a long time coming and we're not there yet. How close but do we you think will we be. are getting? You know, when the, you know, the justification for the human genome project, the scientists convinced the government to spend $3 billion and their justification oh. was we will cure disease. Yeah. And not a single disease has been cured. They were wrong. <sighs> One of the reasons they were wrong is because the genome was much more complicated than anyone imagined. Mm. It's not just, you know, read this section, make this gene. It's so incredibly complicated, but that'd be a whole nother thing. In fact, I have a, a uh, article on creation.com called the multi or the four dimensional genome and a DVD that we sell called the high tech cell, similar topic. Uh, if you want to get into the complexity of the genome, I would go there. We'll have that in the show notes. Yeah. Okay, so how does this work? Is it mostly computers that are reading and writing and translating all the DNA information? Or is this a hands-on process? Because if that's the case, then... It's, not, it's all automated. It's all robot-driven. <gasps> oh, it's all computers. Phew. Glad to hear it. 23may.com and Ancestry, they're not actually sequencing DNA. Because I was going to ask, how accurate can it be? Oh, it's, it's, it's spot-on accurate. I mean, 99.99% wow. anyway. But what they do is what they do is they take a giant glass slide. I mean, it's a couple inches and they put little teeny dots of DNA on the slide. So a little little drop of water with the DNA in it and it sticks to the glass when it dries. And they take your DNA and they chop it up and they wash your DNA in little pieces across this glass slide. And because DNA sticks to itself, your DNA will stick to any spot on that slide that's identical to it. Hmm. And by doing that, they'll take a, a piece of DNA that's 100% the same, except there's one letter in the middle that some people have an A and some people have a T. And if your DNA sticks there, they say, oh, you have an A at that location. And it changes color and they just literally, they, they image it on a computer and it scans across 900,000 little dots. <laughs> and all the colored ones say, okay, you have an A there, a T there, a C here, a G there, a T there, an A there, a C there. And they're not sequencing your DNA, but they are looking at, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of letters. And they pick those letters because some of them are ancestry informative. They tell you what continent you came from. Some of them tell you what your hair color and eye color is. Some of them are health informative. They tell you, you know, if you have the breast cancer gene or um, if you're liable to be, uh, have, you know, arthrosclerosis or something like that. I mean, all, all sorts of things they put on that what's called a SNP chip. <laughs> and that's the data you get. It's just a long list of individual letters. It doesn't tell you everything. And it's only the ones they pick. So by having my whole genome sequenced, I was able to look at everything else. So anything that any scientist has ever flagged as a problem or benefit, I can now look at that and say, oh, I don't have that letter. I don't have that letter. Oh, I do have that letter. Oh, I better be careful of X if I have that. See, I want to get to that. Okay. My dad also, but before we get there. Uh, my dad also took the same journey, it sounds like, that you have. So he okay. poured over the family history books, any kind of just uh, data that he could get on the Darnell family tree. And a few of our other Darnell relatives really enjoy this stuff, too. I, cool. I, I'm so glad D- uh, how our histories have inter- intertwined with some American history, uh, Civil War history. But what I've been wondering about, we'll get to later in the show, is like, how has this revealed some real interesting, complex CD family secrets? Before we get to that, I, I just know that as a whole, my dad did the Ancestry.com, I think it was. You did 23andMe. Do you have an opinion about one being better than the other? It, would it, wouldn't it be great if there 
information was all together? Would it make it a better system? More they are, data? They are different, and they do look at different letters. Because I was wondering if like one was a better service to go with than the other. I don't think one is better. Ancestry.com, though, they were around for years before they started doing DNA. So when you take an Ancestry.com test, you are plugged into a community and a communication system that 23andMe doesn't have. At least you know five years ago when I did my test, 23andMe.com, they had better graphics and better scientific explanations of things, which is why I went with them. But their communication system is terrible. At first, it was just, you know, I had all these people I was theoretically related to and no one would communicate with me. It's like, come on. Would you be tempted to use both services? And oh, yeah. Do you get some real benefit for doing that? Oh, yeah. I, I would do that and Family Tree DNA eventually just for fun. And a Family Tree DNA is another service? No, totally different service. Yeah. It's run out of Israel. Interesting. I think. We'll have links to all of this stuff in the show notes. But a lot of people ask, how accurate is it? Because, you know, you see on Facebook, yeah. identical triplets took the same test and they got different results. Yeah. Yeah. Nonsense. <laughs> okay. <laughs> of course they got some different results because the testing is like, you know, 99.99%. When you said that all of this was automated by computers, yeah. and I know how reliable computers yeah. can be, I was thinking that doesn't sound reliable no, enough. It's extremely reliable, but it's not perfect. And if you're looking at 900,000 letters, you're going to get dozens of them that differ if you take the same test again. That's just the way it is. <sighs> it's it's, it's mm. the, the nature of science. You can't get perfection. And so identical triplets will be different. Just like if you did three tests yourself, you wouldn't get exactly the same test. Well, the way that you were describing the plates and putting a little bit of the blood sample on there and doing the spit chemical... Spit sample, yeah. It, okay, so spit. Okay, thank you. All right. Actually, then, no, there's no spit there. They What they do is they run, they take your spit, they chop up your cells, extract the DNA, and run it through a thing called PCR, polymerase chain reaction where they make lots and lots and lots and lots of copies of your DNA. Really? Yeah. You can copy, duplicate, replicate oh, the that's, DNA? That's the the backbone of the entire genetics revolution. Uh, I'm weirded out now because for some reason that had not occurred to me. What someone figured out, in fact, I got a Nobel Prize for this, that you can take a bacterial polymerase, uh, enzyme that copies DNA in bacteria, oh. and you can put it in a dish with A, T, G, and C. Okay and a little bit of ribose, and a little bit of phosphate. Those are the things that make up DNA. Okay. And yeah. ATP, the energy source that drives the thing. And if you take, if you manufacture maybe a 20 letter long piece of DNA yourself that matches something of the DNA you want, and you put it in there, and you warm it up, and then cool it down. As it cools down, that little piece of DNA that you put in there will stick to the other DNA. And then the DNA polymerase will start there and start sequencing DNA. Oh my word! And that's then you essentially warm it up again. DNA cloning. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, not that's not the correct technical term. Okay. But from a layperson, yeah, you're cloning the DNA. Because I've read a lot of comic books and watched a lot of Saturday morning cartoons, that sounds like cloning to me. Yeah, but that's not really what when we're talking about cloning. That's not what it is. But you make copies of it, and so even if you only have a couple of copies of that piece of DNA that you want, all of a sudden, let's say you have two when you start with. That's not many. Now you have four. And they do it again. Then you have eight. You do it again. You get 16. You do it again. You get 32. You get this exponential multiplication of your target DNA. And that's, I mean, that's what we did in, when I was in graduate school. That's how we cloned our fluorescent proteins. That's how I got the DNA out of coral and got it into fish and made bright green and bright red fish. Okay. Explain that story. And what practical purpose did it serve? Well, when I left, they had taken my green and red gene that I had taken from a coral and they were trying to get it into a fish near a cancer gene. So when the fish got cancer, the tumor would be green. And when he was cured of cancer, the tumor would no longer be green. Well, oh, that is interesting. It's the only visual gene that we have are the green fluorescent protein families. Hmm. Now, they weren't successful, but that's what they were doing. So there's lots of practical applications. What we were doing was taking a coral from my coral lab, chopping it up with a razor blade, dropping it into a solution that would extract the RNA, turning the RNA into DNA, and throwing all of that DNA into bacteria. And then we put it in an incubator. And the next morning, I might have a plate with a couple thousand bacteria on it. And one or two of them will be bright green. <laughs> because they got the gene from the coral into bacteria. And then we took that and cut out of the bacteria. 
and put it in something. Um, you know, this is fish in, in Antarctica that doesn't freeze even when it's below freezing. Yeah. He, he makes a little antifreeze protein. It's a short little protein, but he makes a lot of it. Well, we stole the promoter for that gene and put it next to our green fluorescent protein gene and then literally took a needle and stuck it into fish eggs. And half the eggs would die, but half of those would be green that didn't die. And then maybe half of those, the babies would be green, which means that the DNA integrated into the fish genome. Whoa. And then we did the same thing with the red. And then we had one line where we crossed the red and the green and we made pumpkin colored fish. And they were so beautiful. Really? <laughs> orange fish. <laughs> Did y'all keep the fish around? Oh, Are yeah. They... Oh, any time a VIP came to campus, they were going through our lab oh. every single time. Oh, yes. Wow. Interesting. Oh, but uh, that's off the beaten path. Yeah, that, but see, that's it's this whole ancestry thing is wrapped up with DNA technology. They're They're developing at the same time. The same tools are being used for personal genetics as some you know genetic engineer can use in his laboratory. So that leads to my next question. How has this led to changes for societies on the whole? What, what does it mean for the future of the technology? And what are they working on next? Where are they going with this? Oh, you, it's, you're, because, you're not going to like this one. No, yeah, there, no, there's I have a, a feeling. There's a new thing called the nanopore, nanopore sequencing. What they do is they get a polymerase trapped inside a little teeny microscopic hole in a plate of stainless steel, I think. And if you take millions of those in an array and point a TV camera at it, where each pixel on the TV is looking at one DNA polymerase, well, as it's sequencing DNA, it's actually making the, the ACs, Gs, and Ts are tagged with fluorescent molecules, and they light up. And so you can watch millions of DNA sequences happen in real time on the fly with a TV camera. And they're talking about making these things like the size of the palm of your hand. <laughs> and if you put one of those on a subway, it would be sequencing all of the environmental DNA oh. from every rat and every cockroach and every person. <laughs> it would be sequencing all the cold and flu and coronaviruses. It would be doing personally identifiable information. Oh, hey, Joe got on the subway this morning. Yep, yep, his DNA just came through. Yeah. Because everyone is shedding hair and skin cells constantly. We're leaving a cloud of DNA around us all the time. And the sequencing technology is getting to the point where we can deploy it anywhere. And it's almost instantaneous. Wow. Now, is that a little big, big brother for you? <laughs> yeah. Well, but it, it's coming. I, I, I know that this devastates privacy. There's going to be countries that agree to it. And is there any hope of countries that do not? It, it's too late anyway. Privacy is gone. Yeah. There's no longer anything called a private adoption or secret adoption. Any act of infidelity that resulted in the birth of a child is hmm. is now open. That was one of the other things about these services, the ancestry.com and how do you know what's public and what's not? You know, yeah. you get in you do this, yeah. you could get your family into hot water. And then the CIA or the FBI, they subpoena Ancestry.com say, we need your records. We're looking for this person. They say no. Or they say yes. Mm. Ooh, wow. So there was a famous case mm, four or five years ago now. The Golden State Killer, a notoriously bad person in California, killed a bunch of people. And he was never caught. But they had a, um, a crime scene sample. And this crime lab worked it up and submitted it to a free website where anyone can load up their DNA. And sure enough, they found this guy's second cousins. Oh. And by doing a simple family tree building thing on maybe Ancestry.com, if you like, they said, it's that guy. There's no one else. It has to be him. So they got a, a, a court order and these detectives followed him around and he drunk a cup of coffee and threw the cup in the trash and they grabbed the cup and took a swab off the rim where his lips had touched it and the DNA matched. <laughs> The Golden State Killer is now behind bars. That was the first time this had ever been done. And now it's becoming routine. We're also able to identify all sorts of people that died that we were never able to identify before. Really? The John Doe and the Jane Doe. Oh, hey, this person now, you know, so now families are like, oh, I finally know what happened to my daughter in 1978. Oh. And they're getting closure. But also there's a, a professor, a genetics professor, 
He wrote an article called 23andMe.com gave my parents the gift of divorce. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> we got, well, okay. <laughs> as, a, as a class project, he decided that he wanted to um, get his DNA looked at and his parents looked at. And he's going to have their, this class, you know, examine the data. Okay. And as soon as he did it, someone wrote him a message. Hey, I was adopted. I've been looking for my family all these years. You're my half brother. <gasps> yeah, apparently dad had an extramarital child and mom didn't know. <laughs> oh, this is going to happen so many times over then. Yeah, and families are readjusting to think anytime anyone sequences any piece of DNA from them, there's a chance that something strange is going to happen. And so these uh, unexpected paternity events are common, probably one to three percent. And they're more common in cities than they are in the country, interestingly. And they happen all the time. Hmm. And so everyone, you know, if you're getting into this, you should be it's, it's just, prepared it's about this, for the possibilities. I mean, think about it, right? We're all hunkered down because one to three percent chance we might die from the coronavirus. And look at all the steps we're taking. Well, guess what? You send a sample to Ancestry.com, there's a one to three percent chance that you're going to be related to someone you didn't know. And adoptions, there's no way to hide an adoption today. <sighs> I think that I would want to know. So I've been wondering about this too, because now that my dad has his sequenced and he was able to get the report and it was able to shed some interesting light on the Darnell family tree. Very cool. But then there's a part of me that said, well, this is not my favorite hobby. And now that I have all this information on my dad, I know what it basically says about me. So I don't need to do this. Oh, wait, but there's my mom and her side of the family. And she hasn't done the test and found her results, you know, maybe she does, maybe she doesn't, but I kind of want to know about myself and I, I would have to do the test for myself to find that out. So do it. See, I waited a long time. I mean, even though I was, should have been one of the people who first did it. No, I waited because I was worried about privacy. I was worried that there were going to be, you know, identifiable marks in some people and not other people. And it turned out to not be true. We're all mutts. We're all a giant mixture. I'm, I am a generic European. There's nothing to mark me as, oh, you're one of those. Right. And I just, I share DNA with millions of other people. We're one giant family. Mm. And that was nice to know. And it's true for everyone. Everyone is a mixture of everybody. You got millions of ancestors and you have millions of relatives in, in the world today. So privacy thing, in that sense, I waited until lots of people had taken it. And no curveballs were being found. And that's when I did it. Mm. And yeah, do it, man. I mean, it's cheap, especially because the... Um, the market's been saturated and the number of people taking these tests is going down. Yeah. Uh, so I want to find a, a, see if I can the find The tests a are getting discount. cheaper because the companies are getting desperate. So well, my birthday is coming up. Hey, so hey. I, I could see you doing this. So what I was wondering then, and one of the reasons why I'm interested in this personally, is for how this could help me improve my health. And I would want to do the same thing for my wife. So I was thinking about our diet, our sleep, our uh, even maybe like how this affects how, how much sun we should get. And so what do you know about that? And what does it do? do is that stuff any good? Would that actually benefit us? The human body is so complicated. There are very, very few letters in our genome where you can say, if you have that letter, you have X. I mean, 23andMe says I'm supposed to have blue eyes and I have brown eyes. We talked about that in another episode. Right? Yeah, there, it's very clear. I'm looking at them right now. There's not a chance that you have a shred of blue. So most letters in the genome don't have a specific effect because it's all the letters all together that make us a person. And so, yeah, you might have something that might give you a risk of heart attack, but you might have something that actually reduces your risk of heart attack. Mm. And so it's not easy. There are specific things that we will learn more as we go and be able to make better recommendations to people as far as health is concerned. But the general health guidelines from 20 years ago still work. Don't eat too much and get a lot of exercise. Okay. Yeah. Which I would. And if something makes you feel bad, don't eat it. Yeah. So it wouldn't help to know, the have the book on my DNA. It, it might help. In fact, one of the reasons I did it because I wanted to know, and it turns out, I'm very happy. In fact, I wrote a letter to all my sisters and my parents. I asked them first. I said, if one of your siblings had their DNA sequence, would you want to know? And they all said, Yes. And there's only one thing that um, I know it affected one of my aunts, actually, but my parents don't have it and none of us have it. So we probably don't carry it. But my DNA flagged that that thing. So, oh, so I need to pay attention to that. But it's only one thing. And honestly, I was actually shocked and very, very happy with how many happy genes I have. Excellent. Wow. Yeah. Re really pleased. You know, fad diets, 
whatever. Speaking and, of which, I remember years ago that there was a, a family member that really enjoyed one of the diets that was called your blood type diet. Uh, yes, that's and in my family also got we pulled have... into it. They needed to stick to certain kinds of nutrients. Yep. They needed to increase a, uh, their diet with a fish. Yeah, and... I, I thought that was the stupidest thing. I said that's just a horoscope. That's ridiculous. Why would? And then I read the top five things that I have, I'm type B. B. I have type B blood. I read the top five things B shouldn't eat. And those are all things that I stopped eating. <laughs> Peanuts, wheat, corn, soy. Those things make me feel bad. Maybe it's not totally stupid. Huh. But even then, um, you know, I actually have met the man who started that diet. At least mm -hmm. his son who's, who's pioneering it now. They had an opening of a store in Brooklyn. I just happened to be on a CMI trip up there. My wife wanted to take me. So we went down. I talked to him. Actually, I Facebooked with him a couple of times. Um, he's not a kook. And he, he also eats things outside of his blood type every day. It's not about losing weight. It's about optimizing your body. It'd be the ideal. Yeah. 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 And On it's, best case scenario. Yeah. But for most people, it makes no difference at all. Hmm. Okay. So what was the other thing you wanted to talk about? All right. I want to talk about disappearing ancestors. Oh, dear. This is this is going to be the weirdest, weirdest thing. I saved it for last because it's, it's so weird and so fascinating and people are going to be like, what? But no. If you go to creation.com and type in the genealogical Adam and Eve. Uh, Dr. John Sanford and I wrote an article. It's actually a pretty harsh review of a of an evolutionist and his claim that you can have a genealogical Adam and Eve, but not a, uh, a genetic Adam and Eve. And he's working on these ideas that I've known for you know over a decade, and I've talked about other people about this too. But here's how it works: you know that you have half the DNA of each of your parents, right? Yes. Okay. And therefore, you have a quarter of DNA of all your grandparents. Yes. That and makes a sense. sixteenth or an eighth and a 16th, a 32nd, a 64th, your, the amount of DNA you get from each of your ancestors gets smaller and smaller and smaller the further back in your family tree you go. Right. Okay. And, I, and that, that, that was something, that, real quick, uh, side note, how far back can the family trees go in the DNA analysis? Four or five generations accurately. Wow. And then not beyond that because of what I'm about to describe. Oh. Every generation, chromosomes recombine. So chromosome number one in the testes or in the ovary, they, they line up and they cross over. And so a mother will give her chromosome number one is parts of her dad and parts of her mom. So a dad's not represented in part of that chromosome. It's not there at all. Right. So if that was your mom, there's parts of your father's chromosome one that you did not get. And it's parts of your, oh, sorry, your grandfather's DNA that you did not get and parts of his wife's DNA that you did not get. And then your dad gave a chromosome one from his parents and you got part of your, his dad's DNA and part of his mom's DNA, but not all of it, only about, you know, a quarter of it. So what happens is these big chunks get inherited every generation, but the amount from each ancestor gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And when that amount you're getting is smaller than a chunk, if you don't inherit that end of a chromosome, you didn't get anything from great, great, great grandma at all. Hmm. And after five or six generations, you know, we're talking the middle 1800s, early 1800s, you might know the names of some of these people. You might not have inherited any DNA from them, even though they're in your family tree. Wow. Huh. After I would have assumed it would have been more. Yeah, I, I would have too. And, and the math is really interesting. But after 15 generations, something like 96% of the people in your family tree aren't your ancestors. You didn't inherit DNA from those people. <sighs> So weird. It's totally uh, weird. And it's yeah. so, it's, it's all cattywampus backwards. What on earth? But it's true. You only have maybe a thousand ancestors that you inherited DNA from. Oh, that is fascinating. If you go back to, um, I don't know, say 20 generations ago, 600 years ago, you would have about 10 million people in your family tree, but you only inherited DNA from about a thousand of them. So people say, you know, I'm a descendant of Charlemagne. And I'm like, yes, so what? You didn't get any of his DNA. Uh, <laughs> In fact, every European is a descendant of Charlemagne. <laughs> you might not know it. You might not be able to figure it out from the family tree, but it's absolutely true that every European is descended from Charlemagne. And if you have a piece of DNA from him, you know, I probably do too. Interesting. If he was oh. one of the lucky thousand, then he's probably the, ant the genetic ancestor of every European mm. or a giant chunk of them. But statistically, he's probably the ancestor genetically of nobody. Ancestry.com says, oh, you have relatives. Yes, so you're not actually related to them. 
Interesting. You have a piece of DNA that you share with Joe Blow. It's a tiny little piece of DNA. Yeah, the that family been, line still exists, but the DNA is not But that there. DNA could be floating around in Europe for a thousand years. Oh, wow. He might. He, he, so they say, you know. It could be elsewhere. Third cousin or greater. Yeah, it could be a lot greater. He might be your third cousin, sure enough. Or he might be your 20th cousin. It's, it's weirder than that. Because of math, you can't have 10 million ancestors 600 years ago. You go back, you go back to like 800 A.D., you would theoretically have more ancestors than the number of people who have ever lived in world history. <laughs> and they can't all be alive at the same time. The, no. the population has never been that large. Right. It's getting bigger. It's not, it doesn't, it isn't bigger in the past. Yeah. It, it's easy to get to a point in your family tree where you have more people place, place marks in your family tree than people alive at that time. It happens about 1200 AD, maybe 1000 AD. Hmm. There's just too many people in your family tree. Therefore... If someone's in your family tree, he's probably in your family tree a thousand times over. <laughs> and it's especially true of Europeans. Europeans have very little genetic diversity. And the, the characteristic thing, um, actually, I've, I've graphed this. I've, I've imaged it. There's a piece of the end of chromosome 16. It's one of the biggest important things that gives European their particular skin color. And almost all Europeans have two identical copies of this gene, meaning we're inbred. Yeah. Meaning we've lost all genetic diversity in that stretch of our genome. Mm. Meaning your mother and your father have the same ancestor. Right. And everyone's mother and everyone's father in Europe has the same ancestor. Ooh, yuck. Well, that is the truth, though. I mean, what can we say? This is where we're at. This is where we're at. But ancestry is, is uncovering such cool things in math and in history. And one of the coolest things is we now know, and I mean, we now know there's no such thing as race. Okay, explain that then. You cannot look at someone's genetics and say, oh, they come from here. Oh, right. Because you're just looking at the outward appearance of someone's eye color, the shape yeah. of their ears, how much hair they have. You can't. There's a, a lot of light-skinned African-Americans who, after the Civil War, and they're light-skinned because of history that we is not polite to talk about, but they said, forget this. I'm not, I'm moving into the city. And they pretended they were white. They merged in with white, white society. Now all these white people, European people, I should say, are getting their ancestry tests back and they got your, they have African pieces of their genome. Yeah. What? Yeah. Cause you got an African ancestor. You didn't know it. Interesting. There was a, a man who was a, a, a mulatto slave in, in Copenhagen and he was, he wanted to be free. And they said, no, you're a slave. So he jumps on a ship and went to Iceland and disappears. In fact, no one even knew he went to Iceland. But now that the Icelanders have gotten into genetics in such a huge way, there's hundreds of people in Iceland who have African pieces of DNA, and they've actually managed to reconstitute half of that man's genome from the little pieces in his descendants. Whoa. There's a, like my Y chromosome, 80% of European, Western European men share my Y chromosomes, R1B. In fact, I share my particular subgroup of Y chromosome with like 3 million other Irish men. So I'm, I'm a total mutt. Or a mutt, but a super common Y chromosome in Western Europe. All the people with my group, we all had a common ancestor not that long ago. It's it's not an ancient group. It's actually a pretty young group. But there is a group of men in Cameroon. That's you know where's Cameroon? It's an African country. If you took Africa and you drew a line horizontally and a line vertically, dead center of Africa is Cameroon, south of Lake Chad. These people living there have the darkest skin of any people on the planet. Mm. And my Y chromosome group is found there. Mm. So remember when I said my dad's yeah. mitochondria was different than my mom's and he was right. like a hunter gatherer thing. Well, there are Y chromosomes also that are older than this, my new group that are floating around in Europe. So I could be more closely related to a man from Cameroon than my Irish great, 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 great grandfather's next door neighbor. Mm. What's a race? Yeah. We have no way to define it anymore oh. because we have mixed throughout all of history across the whole globe and no one has remained isolated from other people. Hmm. Fascinating. We're going to have to talk about this more. It's such a big topic, an interesting topic, complicated, and I, I will get my test done here. I'm not sure when, but I, I am interested in doing it this year. All right. And we'll do a big reveal. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for joining us on our quest. If you enjoyed listening, be sure to share the podcast with your friends and family. The one sure fire way that you can help us grow the audience is if you're one of the helpful listeners, rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts, 
So if you'll do me that favor, it'd be much appreciated because there's just not a lot of great ways to get the social media channels to help promote the podcast, but things like that make a world of difference. And we're just starting out. And so therefore we need lots of help. Oh yeah. We already have a couple hundred listeners and I think we go so much farther. And if you want to dig deeper into this episode's topics, you can find links to the articles and to the websites and the like in the show notes for this episode on our website or in this, uh, in your podcast app of choice along with this episode. So if you got to go to the website to get it, hop over to nightowl.fm slash equinox slash seven. And then you can also find all of us on Twitter. Our show's handle is at podcast equinox and Rob is at Bible genetics and mine is at JCS Darnell. Until next time. Goodbye, Rob. Goodbye, Joe. And you have been listening to Equinox. Equinox.